So let's consider the terminology in context. Two Sudanese girls were taken at gunpoint at age 13 and 14 by men in refugee camps in Kenya. The girls spoke no English and the men brought them into Australia as their wives. Each girl has five children. Allegedly, the men wanted uh, the children for the child payments. The girls have been beaten, raped and abused by their husbands and by other men in the community. So is this marriage? Another domestic violence worker told us, we have cases of girls as young as 14 being pinned down by their own family while their new husband rapes them to seal the deal. They continue to live with their family until 18 and went sent over to the, and are sent over to the uh, man's house whenever he wants sex. Is this marriage? A migrant worker told us underage girls are often brought overseas on holidays by their families and are forced to marry older men to bring them back to Australia and keep wealth within the family. Is this a marriage? In 2011, an Australian-born woman successfully petitioned the family court for orders that her marriage, which occurred in India in 2009, were void due to duress. She had travelled to India where she believed she would marry the Australian boyfriend. When she arrived, her parents confiscated her passport and her father repeatedly threatened to have her boyfriend's sister and mother kidnapped and raped if she didn't marry the other, another man. In the Women's Legal Service submission, they stated that clients had told them that they did not want to get married but their hus to their husband, but they knew there was no real alternative available to them because they would be rejected by their family and their community. Many of these clients would not identify their marriage as being forced, but rather part of their commitment to their culture, their families and their communities. For this reason, we must always be mindful that for some people, the act of leaving their family is excruciating, despite the abuse and exploitation they face each day, as family occupies a very important role in their life and their personal identity. It is important to keep culture, religion and language in mind when considering the challenges of uh, faced by victims of forced and servile marriage. The terms forced and servile marriage, both domestically and internationally, have been adopted without, with little dispute. Even the United Nations refers to the issue as forced marriage. The closest the terminology has come into question is through Akrath employing the term sham marriages in lieu of forced or servile, servile marriage to highlight the underlying illegitimacy of the marriage. This is a start, but I would contend this does not go enough to help victims. Good Shepherd strongly advocates for both legislative and non-legislative measures in Australia to address the problem of what is currently called forced and servile marriage. We would also encourage the consideration of a more victim-focused terminology that aids increased community understanding. The terminology should empower women to identify the violation of their rights and give them the courage to seek help. Whilst forced and servile marriage lies within the definition of marriage, this may be an impediment. Changing the terminology could empower victims to speak out, seek help, knowing it's not a marriage and they do have rights. Thank you.